Hey everyone, welcome back to The Food Forest. Today's video, we're gonna talk about some really important topics. Uh, things like the economy, what's happened over the last couple of years, and predicting going forward, including some like, I don't know, some really dark thoughts that I've had about where is this going? Like what's the actual, what's the actual end point of creating a society where everyone's poor except for just a very few? And we're gonna actually draw on some kind of rather violent and bloody parallels in the past. All links are going to be down in the description below. I always like to reference everything that I state. Now, a lot of this video is going to actually be very anti-capitalism, and I want to kind of keep it as apolitical as possible. The problem is when the, when the problems that we face are created by politics, it's really hard to decouple politics and the problem. Okay, so let's just get into it, shall we? Uh, the most important video you'll ever watch on my channel is this one. When COVID really hit and the governments were trying to stop the spread of the disease, the idea was that if we could lock down people, then we could stop the spread and contain it. And I'm not going to get into too much of that other than talking about the stimulus packages, where the money went, and you know how your government doesn't necessarily represent your best interest, and how we don't even really have a democracy anymore. What we really have is a corporatocracy. But all countries actually created these stimulus packages you know, for COVID in, or in order to keep the economy from basically imploding on itself. So what happened? The United States basically came up with a giant stimulus packages where 800 billions of dollars were given out as PPP loans to companies in order to offset you know, utilities and rent and ongoing company costs like wages in order to keep the company solvent. And it, it was done with a good reason. We, if, if the companies fail and people lose their jobs and everything fails, and you know, people literally will die and starve. So, you know, the theory behind it is good, but like anything where you have a change in a system where you have rules and governance set up, you're going to get people taking advantage of it. Uh, $800 billion were given out in PPP loans. For example, Tom Brady received a million dollar PPP loan for his company. And if you're asking why does a multi-millionaire football star need a million dollar PPP loan? That's probably a good question and you'll probably like this video. Now, a lot of US Republican representatives actually got PPP loans and it's led to some funny gotcha moments. <laughs> Now, don't think I'm getting political and hating on the Republicans because a bunch of Democrats who also had PPP loans. Now, the defense that's been used for all of these is that one company that they own took the loan and they don't run the day-to-day -day company, so therefore they didn't personally take the loan, but neither did anybody. And if you're the owner, then it's your responsibility to actually know what your company's doing on any time. And just to put it into perspective, at my job, if we have a lunch with a contractor and they buy us a pizza, if I eat a slice of pizza, I could possibly be terminated for that. So if I can't eat a piece of pizza, but these people can have hundreds of thousand dollars of PPP loans forgiven, on top of being able to insider trade in the stock market, something's not right with who they're actually representing. And they're not representing you, they're representing themselves and the corporations that pay them. And I think this is the funniest thing in politics because they make it out like there's this left and the right and they get you to argue, you know, with your neighbor. 
Meanwhile, they're all doing the same crap. They're all basically the same person, just wearing a different team jersey and a different mask. And they're really just Scooby-Doo, take the mask off, and it's Exxon Mobil under there. And it's a shame because one of the avenues that people in a free democracy have to drive change is actually to use your voting power to drive change. But how does that help when they basically all lie, they won't do what they say, and they're all bought? And the worst part is... The people who are actually the most legit, they are the ones that have the hate campaigns out. And that's just the reality of the world today, is that the media is controlled by very few people, and they're trying to push an agenda, no matter what side you're listening to. And it's really important to know that you're constantly being programmed and brainwashed. And usually it's the people who they're making you try to hate, those are the ones that are actually trying to change things. It was 200 and $15 for one pill. Do you know what the price of Revlimid was in 2013? I can look it up, but I don't recall. I don't have it in front of me. 412 per pill. How about the price? Let's get into more recent where your memory may be jogged. How about 2017? I would say approximately $700 a pill, but I, again, I don't have it in front of me. 719 per pill, and today, Revlimid is cost seven hundred and sixty three dollars per pill. I'm curious, did the drug get substantially more effective in that time? Did cancer patients need fewer pills? During that time, the uh, development of Revlimid included six additional indications, uh, some in lymphoma, and the balance in uh, patients with different segments. Oh, great. I, I want to re reclaiming my time. So, Mr. Ellis, you discovered more patients who might benefit from paying $763 a pill. Or did the drug start to work faster? Were there fewer side okay. effects? How did you change the formula or production of Revlimid to justify this price increase? You said recently that nobody pays the list price, but that is not correct. Do uninsured patients sometimes pay the list price? I can imagine there are circumstances where underinsured or uninsured patients would be paying close to or at the list price. I, I want to turn to one other number if you would, you would help me. Um, do you know what this number is? I, Does it ring I any bells? I, I think you're referring to my compensation in some way. Yo, in some way. This was your compensation in 2017 for being CEO of Celgene. And that's a lot of money. It's 200 times the average American's income and 360 times what the average senior gets on Social Security. Now, of that $13 million, about $2.1 million came from your company hitting yearly earning targets. Um, and more than half of the bonus formula was based on those targets. Any increase in the price of Revlimid would also increase your bonus. If revenues increased and expenses did not, then earnings would be enhanced. And Thank you. Mr. Ellis, in fact, the oversight the committee found that if you hadn't increased the price of Revlimid, you wouldn't have gotten your bonus. Mr. Ellis, do you know how much you personally received in bonuses over two years, the last two years, just because Celgene raised the price of this one drug, Revlimid? I receive very generous compensation, but I don't know the exact number that you're referring to. In fact, you personally received half of a, half a million dollars personally just by tripling the price of Revlimid. So to recap here, the drug didn't get any better, the cancer patients didn't get any better, you just got better at making money. You just refined your skills at price gouging. And to be clear, the taxpayers spent $3.3 billion on Revlimid. Now, of all the PPP loans that were given out, these $800 billion, dollars over 90 percent of them have actually been completely forgiven now when you consider where these ppp loans were funded from you know it's our tax dollars to pay for the government and the tax dollars basically that we got is just our own money given back to us uh, the tax dollars that went for the ppp loans is our money that's given out to the corporations and before you're like oh they printed money for this it gets worse and i'll explain that 
But 90% of these PPP loans were actually forgiven to corporations, which means actually that money wasn't a loan. It was just a, here you go, here's a bunch of money. And to make things worse, the University of Texas has actually created a study where they found out that $64.2 billion of the loans were completely fraudulent. Like this guy here who paid $47,000 to buy a Pokemon card. Now, back when the stimulus package was released, I made a video. This was years before inflation actually hit, and I said, hey, heads up, this is going to create inflation. Since then, people have said, oh, this was a very prophetic what you said. And to me, it's just, you know, if you understand any kind of basic economic theory, it's not prophetic. It's just this is the way that this will play out. Like, not it might play out, it, it will play out that way. Now, it's actually interesting because some studies recently have shown that the inflation that we're experiencing now is actually quite a bit to do with price gouging of corporations. And yes, I will get to that as well. Well, I think everybody watching this video can already feel how bad inflation is. But typically what we use to track inflation is something called the Consumer Price Index. This is the CPI. And this was roughly 6%. In the last year and if you think inflation felt like it was higher than six percent you're right and the way that cpi actually deals with this is they look at how much everything costs how much does a car cost you to buy how much is your rent and how is that compared to previous years now there's a common misconception that the cpi actually excludes uh, food energy and housing prices and this is actually just complete misinformation that's totally false However, the component, the core component that each of these makes up in the fractal CPI aggregate does change every year. And there's this misconception that it's been removed completely. However, the weighting of it has changed quite a bit. And depending on what you're buying, you can actually have a higher component of inflation. When pasta costs 47% more, cereals cost 21% more, and bread and buns costing 20% more, it's not really reflective of actually how much more expensive your life is. What actually matters in terms of how well your life is, is what your post-tax, post-expenses savings rate is. So if after you've paid for all of your taxes and expenses, you're, you manage to save, say, $500 a year, you're actually going to slowly accumulate wealth, you know, slowly. And hopefully you can accumulate wealth in a way that outpaces inflation. Now, the interesting thing with your post-tax savings and inflation is that inflation can rise, say, 10%. So your daily life gets 10% more expensive. But actually, what matters is if that 10% additional cost takes out that entire $500 a year that you're saving, you've lost 100% of your actual post-tax, post-expenses savings account. And now, all of a sudden, maybe you can't afford to pay your mortgage. So it's important to note that even a small inflation increase, if wages don't catch up and keep up with that inflation, can actually cause people to lose their houses because it takes them from being responsible people who are saving money to now as responsible as they can try to be, they're not able to actually earn a living wage. Now it's estimated that in the last couple of years, this has been the hardest stress that people have been for a very long time since the Great Depression. And you would think that companies are struggling just as much as us, but actually they're not. Companies are experiencing record profits at the same time that they're telling us to cut back and that they need to cut costs. In 2022, BP, Exxon, Chevron, Shell, and Total Energies accumulated a total of $200 billion in profits. This is actually a 122% increase over their previous years. Additionally, the top coal companies in the world earned a profit of $97 billion, which represents a tripling of their profits. Now, the profits of coal, oil, and gas should really hammer the food industry really bad, and you would expect that food producers are experiencing a very hard time, but that's, that's also wrong. The increase in costs are just being passed on to you, and this is basically through inflation. But it's not inflation, it's just corporate greed. In 2022, Sam's Club increased their profits 17%, Costco 15%, Walmart 12%, CVS 11%, and Kroger 5%. So even all these food distribution companies are seeing record profits at the same time that they're saying that they can't increase wages in order to keep up with inflation. So now as your post-tax, post-expenses savings rate crashes and you're finding it hard to make your mortgage payments, even if you're able to get into real estate, 
you know, one missed mortgage payment equals foreclosure by the bank. And looking down the pipeline, we've got all these COVID mortgages that were created at roughly two and a half to 3% interest. Now I know in the States you can get a lot of fixed term mortgages, but in Canada, especially most of the mortgages are now variable rate and they're locked with five year terms. So when those mortgages come due roughly in about two years and people have to renegotiate their old 2% mortgage into a new six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10% mortgage, and they've got an $800,000 mortgage because the housing bubble is absolutely ridiculous in Canada, we're going to see complete and utter economic collapse. In fact, one of the only things that hasn't created the economic collapse yet is that employment is actually really high right now. And employment is the only thing that's saving the economy from collapsing. Now in the US, the Federal Reserve has actually expressed that they're gonna keep hiking interest rates and their target goal is to create a small recession. Now the economy is having a very hard time filling slave wage, minimum wage jobs, jobs that can't even support a livable wage. And what this recession will trigger is that a lot of middle class people will lose their jobs and the goal is that these people then, out of desperation, fill the minimum wage jobs that are currently vacant. The fundamental reality of what we're seeing these days is that many jobs don't even provide a living wage. Over the last couple of years, I've really been conflicted with one thing that doesn't make a lot of sense. If I'm a capitalist and I exist because of this system that's been created, this, this natural resource extraction system, this uh, labor extraction system where the poor are getting poorer and I am getting richer, it's really in my best interest to actually preserve the system, right? I don't want to have it implode. So what's the end goal here? What do you get if you have a bunch of people who can barely even afford to live? And I have some dark thoughts of where this goes, and I don't think it's necessarily intentionally where it goes, but it's where it's gonna go. It's very similar to what happened in the early 19th century with mining. Now back in the early 1900s, capitalism was actually almost as bad as it is now in terms of the wealth gap between the wealthy and the poor. There was this extremely wealthy bourgeoisie class that owned all the major companies and then the proletariat who were basically just poor and destitute. And capitalism is one thing when everyone's on equal grounds. Now, a lot of this is anti-capitalist, and I've actually grown up completely a free market libertarian thinker. The thing is, is as I get older and I start to see how the world actually works, I realize that we've actually never even had a free market. You know, so for all the people who are espousing that we should let the market, the free market solve things and that the free market will sort it out, what free market? We don't have a free market and the whole first half of this video is evidence of that. You know what else is evidence of that? The 2008 bailout package. You know what else is evidence of that? Literally everything else in the course of human history. I mean, the fact that corporations can lobby government to actually create laws that benefit them can kind of tell you that capitalism is right off the rails. And when I'm talking about a wealth discrepancy from the rich and the poor, I'm not talking about the guy down your street with a slightly bigger house. I'm not talking about your Uncle Bob who's got a vacation house. I'm not even talking about someone who's got hundreds of millions of dollars. Those people don't even have a seat at the table of the big players, the billionaires. There's a chart I saw recently that I can't get out of my head. A Harvard business professor and economist asked more than 5,000 Americans how they thought wealth was distributed in the United States. This is what they said they thought it was. 
dividing the country into five rough groups of the top, bottom, and middle three 20% groups. They asked people how they thought the wealth in this country was divided. Then he asked them what they thought was the ideal distribution. And 92%, that's at least 9 out of 10 of them, said it should be more like this. In other words, more equitable than they think it is. Now that fact is telling, admittedly, the notion that most Americans know that the system is already skewed unfairly. But what's most interesting to me is the reality compared to our perception. The ideal is as far removed from our perception of reality as the actual distribution is from what we think exists in this country. And let's distribute it among our 100 Americans. Well, here's socialism. Okay, I mean, that's not socialism. That's extreme communism. I do find it a little funny that that's what they think socialism is. All the wealth of the country distributed equally. We all know that won't work. We need to encourage people to work and work hard to achieve that good old American dream and keep our country moving forward. So, here's that ideal we asked everyone about. Something like this curve. Okay, the funny thing is this is probably pretty close to socialism. But hey, even the poor folks aren't actually poor, since the poverty line has stayed almost entirely off the chart. We have a super healthy middle class with a smooth transition into wealth. And yes, Republicans and Democrats alike chose this curve. Nine out of 10 people, 92%, said this was a nice ideal distribution of America's wealth. But let's move on. This is what people think America's wealth distribution actually looks like. Not as equitable, clearly, but for me, even this still looks pretty great. Yes, the poorest 20 to 30 percent are starting to suffer quite a lot compared to the ideal, and the middle class is certainly struggling more than they were, while the rich and wealthy are making roughly 100 times that of the poorest Americans, and about 10 times that of the still healthy middle class. Sadly, this isn't even close to the reality. Here is the actual distribution of wealth in America. The poorest Americans don't even register. They're down to pocket change. And the middle class is barely distinguishable from the poor. In fact, even the rich between the top 10 and 20 percentile are worse off. Only the top 10 percent are better off. And how much better off? So much better off that the top 2 to 5 percent are actually off the chart at this scale. And the top 1%, this guy, well, his stack of money stretches 10 times higher than we can show. Here's his stack of cash, restacked, all by itself. We don't even have to achieve what most of us consider might be ideal. All we need to do is wake up and realize that the reality in this country is not at all what we think it is. Okay, now consider that this video is 12 years old and based on everything that you know of the world today and everything that you've seen in this video so far of mine, is the situation better or worse than this? And if anyone wants a fantastic book to read that gives you a glimpse into the ways that the billionaires think, especially with the impending climate disasters and ecosystem collapse that we're expect expecting, there's a book called Survival of the Richest. And this is a book written by Douglas Rushkoff that talks about an interview and a talk that he was brought into this kind of inner circle of mega billionaire preppers and how they were preparing for what they saw as disruption severe enough to kind of cause them to have to escape society. And that's largely what they were planning on doing is that escaping society and they were escaping the things that they themselves created. Capitalism was really off the rails in the early 1900s with basically the exploitation of everything in North America. We're talking about clear-cutting forests and taking down all the, all the amazing old-growth forests and these giant redwoods, these pictures of people cutting down trees that they have to, you know, have entire families wrapping around. And some of them they actually cut and ship to Boston just to show that they could actually cut the wood down. And they're destroying ecosystems and not even getting wood out of it. It was just sent to Boston to show that it could be done. And after that, well, we all know what happened. In 1912 to 1921, there was the West Virginia Coal Wars. And these were actually probably some of the most end state capitalism things that we've seen. 
and everything that I'm seeing now reminds me of where this could go. If you were a coal miner in the early 1900s, you really worked in one of the coal towns, and the coal town was owned largely by the mining company, and even all the gear and food that you bought were owned by stores that were owned by the mining company. And as you can imagine, there was extreme markups on everything from their tools to their food to their housing. And miners then became indebted to the mining company that employed them. And at the same time, mining jobs were extremely dangerous and there was long lasting health effects, not only black lung, but many other toxins that they were actually inhaling as they were doing their job as a servant to the company that owned them. Now in 1912, miners tried to actually unionize in what was one of the largest social revolutions that happened in the United States. And the miner in these socialist revolutions wanted basic things like, I don't want to die, I want to be able to feed my family, and I want to be able to choose where I buy my stuff. Now this was seen as egregious by the coal companies, and they actually hired Baldwin Feltz and detectives to put down the protests. At the same time in the United States, there was a huge socialist movement swelling, and they provided the coal workers with machine guns and high-powered rifles to fight against the coal companies. This ended up culminating in the Battle of Blair Mountain. Coming out of this, there was a huge socialist upheaval where work was unionized and we had the New Deal policies being formed and we had FDR and all of these socialist revolutionary thinkers that actually created the foundation for what was largely the golden boom of the United States of America and workers' rights in general. And since then, after the Cold War in Russia, Socialism has kind of really been uh, labeled as communism. And I think what's really important right now to understand is using the examples of the stimulus packages is that right now in the United States, you think you have capitalism, you know, and not just the United States, Canada too. We think we have capitalism, but we really don't. We have capitalism for the poor, but we have socialism for the rich. So while this propaganda campaign is out there since the Cold War equating socialism with communism, and making it so that if we help our fellow person out and we unionize and we create workers' rights, that somehow, you know, we're an equivalent to a communist regime. Meanwhile, the rich are experiencing some of the best socialism that's ever existed in the history of the economy, whereas we're all left out to dry with struggling constant inflation that's reducing our ability to live a meaningful life. So over the last couple of years, I've really pondered, you know, what's the end game here? How, how does a capitalist benefit from a society that can barely feed itself? And I think you don't necessarily have to look any further than the 19, early 1900s and the miners. So what happens when housing prices stay artificially high, interest rates get spiked to try to fix the economy, and people can't afford their house and they foreclose on it? Well, the people who are in the best financial state to take advantage of that will. And it happened in the Great Recession, it happened in 2008, and it's going to happen again now. And that's that the wealthy and the people who already have the capital will go in and seize more. The housing market is already artificially inflated because it's being bought up by companies in order to sell them back as rental properties. So what happens when the rich controls the entire food market and housing market and there's no real estate to buy, you have to rent and everything is rent to own, you basically become an indebted slave into the job and you're farmed. Human beings will be farmed for the only valuable commodity that they have left, that's their labor. And I don't think that any of this is being done in an intentional way. I think this is actually worse than that. I think that this is just end state capitalism and how it plays out. 
let's not end it there. I, I always like to end on hope. You know, it's, it's really easy to be a doomer when you're seeing ecosystem collapse and climate change and the economy collapse and the, just the way that capitalism is destroying everything that we hold dear and everything that we love. And especially when you're thinking that, you know, the real price of this is paid by the children. It's paid by our children. And this is why capitalism is just the perfect weapon. It's the perfect storm because it, it incentivizes and rewards short-term profit-making at the cost of long-term destruction of the environment. Then any time that you give a reward to someone for something, and then you also make them not have to pay the consequence of it, and you make someone else pay the consequence of, of it, they're going to do that thing. And this is why capitalism is going off the rails and gets worse all the time. And it's why that capitalism in the 1900s when it was getting really out of control, led to a giant socialist revolution. Whether that happens again, I'm not sure. I just don't think that people are going to allow this to continue to happen. So how do we fight back? It's, in my opinion, not by actually fighting back. The people who want to organize um, and fight this back with violence, you know, guns and militias and actual violent protests, you're trying to fight the state with the single thing that the state is best at. If anyone thinks that an armed militia is going to actually challenge the United States Army, for example, you're absolutely delusional. One reason why gun rights are so important in the United States is because a lot of people see that as a way to fight back tyranny. The thing is, is back when the amendments were created in the founding days of the actual Constitution, that was possible. Farmers with rifles could actually fight back against the government who also had roughly the same technology. That's just not the world today and that's not the reality of today. So if our thoughts are fighting this with violence, it's going to fail and it's going to be bloody. The real way that we have to fight this is we have to fight it using capitalism's weapons. We have to fight it Understanding that capitalism isn't being inherently malicious, it's just doing capitalism. Capitalism is just being capitalism. It's following supply and demand. And the only way to fight this is by changing demand. Some of the things, like housing, is going to be a lot harder to fight. And especially if the collapse comes in a couple years and companies go out and buy even more houses and there's no land to buy and you have to become a renter, it's going to be harder and harder and harder to fight back. So the way that we have to fight back is by maximizing our income, which means looking at any kind of potential income streams that you can create on your side. Thankfully, with the gig economy, this is the best time ever to be able to create a side business or a side income, whether that is dog grooming, whether it is knitting sweaters, whether it's making jars and pottery and selling art. This is the best time in history for you to do that. So get started on creating side incomes. I'm making a YouTube channel to spread awareness about activism and environmental issues. That is me prepping for what I see coming. The second thing is you have to reduce your expenditures. You have to reduce how much money you're spending. Every dollar that I spend that I can, you know, I've got five fa five family members, but every dollar that I spend, I want it to, d to reduce the cost of living in my future. So that is, for example, buying an EV. It's putting solar panels on my roof and it's planting a food forest for food security. And it's even, you know, putting in the pond for water security and a potential cash crop of fish that I can grow, like koi that I can sell and create a side income. You have to look at ways that you can both minimize your future expenses and also increase revenue streams. I've been saying this for a couple years now that if watching food prices and everything that's happened in the last five years still hasn't made you believe what I said three years ago, you have to start growing some of your own food just as a matter of responsibility to you and your friends and your family and your kids. There's no point having a grass lawn if your grass lawn doesn't feed you. Take a square of that grass lawn somewhere in your backyard, your front yard, plant some food that will offset some of what you're buying in the store. And I always say that you pay for nutrition, not calories. It's really cheap to buy calories in the store. It's really, really hard to actually, expensive to actually buy nutrition. So really focus on growing your nutrition. Grow leafy greens, it's the best you know, value for your money that you can possibly get. 
Potatoes are great, but you can buy a bag of potatoes or carrots, you know, at the store for fairly cheap. Really try to focus on getting that nutrient dense food going in your property and get that going like right now. Lastly, as much as the collapses that we're probably going to see coming in the future are going to be scary, it's also, you know, Littlefinger from Game of Thrones, where there's chaos, there's opportunity. Chaos is a ladder. It's really important that you get your life set as good as you can. Try to free up as much capital as you can so that when things do crash, you can actually take advantage of it. When I'm talking about the rich buying up all the land, there's no reason that you can't do that also if you can try to get there. So if you can try to get to the place where you can actually free up some kind of money so that you can take advantage of when somebody has to sell their property, you can go in and swoop it up and that is your future forever home permaculture property. Keep your eyes open over the next couple of years. There's going to be tremendous opportunity to buy up cheap land and convert it into a sustainable, regenerative permaculture food forest and homestead. I hope this video was interesting. Please support us on Patreon or the membership program below. It's the best way to support us. You know, YouTube ad revenue is pretty crappy. So if you want to support us and you get any value out of these videos, consider joining below. Thanks for watching, everybody, and I'll see you on the next one.